Hi, my name is Stephen Reznikov. I'm a professor at the DePaul College of Law, and I'm director of its Center for Jewish Law and Judaic Studies, JLJS. I believe that JLJS is the only center of its kind at a law school in the entire Midwest and perhaps far beyond. Most often, we focus on contemporary topics of urgent concern to the Jewish community, such as the multidimensional and ex existential threat posed by the growing scourge of anti-Semitism and how legal tools may be used to combat it. But today's program is a bit of a departure. Entitled The Kosher Capones, it features an interview of Dr. Joseph Kraus. Dr. Kraus is a professor at the University of Scranton and director of the university's honors program. His research focuses on Jewish Chicago's Jewish history, and is the author of The Kosher Capones, A History of Chicago's Jewish Gangsters. The book tells the fascinating story of, Jew of Chicago's Jewish gangsters, tracing them through the lives, criminal careers, and conflicts of Benjamin Zuki the Buki, Zuckerman, and Lenny Patrick, the eventual head of the syndicate's Jewish wing. The interview will be conducted by Mr. Mitchell Lipkin. Mr. Lipkin is a distinguished member and former chair of the JLJS Advisory Board. Born and raised in Chicago and a member of the firm of Lipkin and Apter, Mr. Lipkin is an experienced and extremely successful personal injury attorney. I just want to make uh, a couple quick announcements. Um, when you, if you haven't noticed, when someone joins, apparently they don't come in muted, and it would be better if, if you know if when people see if for any reason something happens that some technological snafu and you you hear yourself that you should mute yourself um and in addition you might want uh if you don't want your to be seen to your image to be shown up on the tape then you should use the button at the bottom left of your screen not quite the bottom left bottom left is mute but the one next to it says stop video and then you'll just have a black background maybe your name will be there but your 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 face won't show um, and the third thing is, as to questions, please feel free to compose questions throughout the program, but the questions are only going to be asked uh, at near the end of the program. You should use the Q&A button to be able to, to compose the questions. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to the capable hands, quite capable hands, of Mr. Mitchell Lipkin. Thanks so much, Steve, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody and especially to uh, you, Dr. Joseph Kraus. Thank you. Your background is as a professor of creative writing and American literature. Mm -hmm. How did you come to write a book about Jewish gangsters? Uh, well, there, there are two, two answers. The, the, the short one, although I, I'm happy to elaborate, is I, I made the um, discovery sort of late-ish in life that my grandfather himself was a gangster of some consequence um, and more just than that, his his siblings, uh, collectively known as the Miller brothers, were uh, important figures in Chicago organized crime and, and therefore Jewish Chicago organized crime um, in the Prohibition era. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it is I'm, I'm really interested in, in story and how story takes, as one of my mentors, um, some of you might even know Carl Smith at Northwestern, um, describes it as what what's the cultural work that stories do? Um, and so I was fascinated by by the way that the stories of gangsters have a currency in in our conversation um, and in the in the and in, in the culture. In your book, if I remember right, at the very beginning, uh, the genesis of, of the book had something to do with your mother asking you a question about yeah. her family. It, it's crazy. Yes. Yeah. So she walked up to me. Um, I just graduated from college and she, I guess she must have found in some files or papers somewhere, a paperback copy of a book called The Joker is Wild. And it's the biography of a guy named Joe E. Lewis. Um, I, 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 I think we're, we're, we're a young enough audience that we probably don't all know that, know who he was, but he was one of the very first Las Vegas celebrities, um, uh, kind of a multi-purpose entertainer. Uh, by the time he was in Vegas, he was mostly a joke teller, but as a young man, he was more of a tumbler. You know, a little bit of song, a little dance. Um, I don't know about the seltzer in his pants, but it was the whole kind of that was the shtick. And he was a um, his biography. Then uh, he was uh, um, described uh, the traumatic event of his youth. He he worked at, at at the Green Mill Gardens. Again, it's fun to be talking to Chicagoans. I imagine that most of you do know the Green Mill, which is obviously still there in Uptown. Yeah. It used to be a little it used to be a little larger than it is now. It took up, I think, the whole block as opposed to just the the southern. Um, uh, the storefront that it has now. 
but it was a big club and it was secretly owned by um, Capone gunman, machine gun Jack McGurn. Um, and so uh, um, in order to give a sense of how violent Chicago was at the time, I mean, well, uh, um, uh, Lewis was was left, Lewis told McGurn he wanted to leave for more money and McGurn or McGurn thugs uh, beat him up. And literally they cut his face, they poured acid on him, they left him to die on the second floor of, um, of, of his hotel room. Um, and he survived. But the guy who wrote the book, a man named Art Cohn, wanted to give a sense that this is, the Chicago of that era was so violent um, that that was only one of many violent episodes. And in this very small digression, he describes the scene in which Davy Miller and Maxie Miller walk out of a theater, of the LaSalle Theater in, in, in the Loop, um, I, I, I don't remember. It's, it's been long gone. I don't remember, what, but it was in the loop, the address of the LaSalle Theater. And Dean O'Banion, um, a gangster who winds up being, he, the gang he founds is the one wiped out in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. O'Banion walks up to the two of them, puts guns in their stomachs, pulls the trigger, and according to the paperback version, um, Maxie Miller falls down dead. Davy Miller is wounded because the buckle, the belt hits his buckle, which is too high on him. Tell us um, who Maxie Miller was. Well, I, so my, I said to my mother, why did you have me read this? And she said, well, my, my father's name was Maxie Miller, and my uncle was Davy Miller, and I'd heard they were involved with gangsters. Um, so as I say, that, that's the genesis of it, in part because, A, it's an amazing story, I think, but B, the story of that story is equally shocking to me. Like, how is it possible in the space of a single generation to forget that your family was involved in crime like that. My mother literally didn't know until I told her. Um, and I looked it up in various other newspapers and cross-referenced things. Uh, this is all pre-internet, even pre-mostly um, index of new newspapers. But I was able to uncover that. And, and that's that's where the story, my story begins. Joe, it was apparent when I was reading Kosher Capone's that it, it was a, a really thoroughly researched and written book what sources did you rely on? How long did it take you to write this book? And by any chance, did you have a did you have an opportunity to speak with any of the people, any of the figures who inhabit the book? Yeah. Um, well, um, it, I just I dashed it off in about thirty years. That's sort of how it goes, right? <laughs> but um, uh, so I really I did when I first began. It was really in the late nineteen eighties, um, uh, maybe early nineties that I really began doing research, and so. The, the resources that I had evolved over the course of the project. Um, when I first got into it, um, I literally just graduated from college. I would go to the basement of the Herald. I wasn't even the Herald Washington Library then. It was it was at the old, um, was it the Weebolts uh, we building, I think, downtown? They were in the basement. Um, yeah, it was in the, in the space between the old and the new uh, libraries. And I would just, I'd go into the basement and I would go through these, uh, um, you know, photocopied copies of the newspaper microfilm copies and you know i would i would read I, I would have a date so i would look at every single story in each of seven each of the seven daily newspapers at the time read all of them and then because they were competing with each other they would typically mention theories about other things that might have been related to so then i would discover for instance that my my uh my great uncle had been a referee at a boxing match where violence had broken out two years earlier that, and, and so some of those people were suspect, suspects in the shooting before they knew it was O'Banion. So that told me to go back to that incident. I found all the stories related to that. And it, so it became a kind of a spider web uh, connection. But but any lead I had would literally take all day to, to pursue because once I, I, I once I found a date, I'd have to then look it up and cross reference it in all the newspapers. Um, and by, then by the end, you literally you would have some of these indexes. I would just type in the name Davy Miller and I would get 60 hits many of which I'd found, but, but many of which I, I hadn't found before. 30 years, what, uh, what a journey that must have been. <laughs> well, I had a couple of kids along the way. <laughs> they were, I got distracted, but yeah. yeah. Joe, what was the beginning, the time frame of the rise of Jewish gangsters in Chicago? And what, what contributed to that? Yeah, well, I think if, for as long as there have been, for as long as I've been in Chicago, there's been organized crime. That's, that's just sort of who we are as a city. Um, and, and as long as there's been organized crime, there have been Jews who are a part of it. Um, uh, you, you know, the roots really go back to post-fire. Um, we have people who come together right away and begin um, begin organized gambling. Um, they begin, you know, it's, it's a city that's that's rising so quickly. It's so transient, it's early population. Um, but I tend, to, I tend to find the roots, I tend to locate the real roots in 
um, what's called the Levy District of the First Ward. Um, I don't know how familiar you are. With, I guess I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to see your reaction, so I don't know if you're familiar with this particular history or not. Um, the the Levy in the First Ward is that familiar? No, I'm, I, yeah. I pick up at Prohibition. Oh yeah. Well, so it's it's really it's really I think a fascinating um, a fascinating structure. Chicago Chicago depended in large measure on a lot of its illegal activities, even going back before Prohibition. Um, but it also had a kind of a blue blood quality to it. So um, eventually they reached a compromise pretty formally established under Carter Harrison II. I, I assume that's a name that, that registers for, for some people. Uh, before there were the Daily Father and Son, there was Carter Harrison I and Carter Harrison II. And um, uh, Carter Harrison II essentially, even though he was himself a kind of a blue blood wasp figure, um, what he was able to do was say, if you're going to do illegal things, which at that point is mostly gambling and prostitution, um, you got to do it in what's called the Levy District, which is the south part of the first ward. The first ward is the loop. Just south of the loop is the Levy, um, and it's almost anything goes. And you can see um, uh, you can see the kind of corruption and violence. Literally, there are maps that will show you. Uh, there's a saloon called the Bucket of Blood. There are various whorehouses lined up, gambling dens. Um, uh, uh, there's even there's a book um, called If Christ Came to Chicago, which talks about the open cesspool of corruption that's there. But again, it's all contained. It's all it's all located in there. And it's overseen by a couple of aldermen from the first ward named Bathhouse John Coughlin and Hinky Dink Kenna. I don't know if those are familiar names. Um, their man, their man on the scene, the guy who is who's both their co contact back was a guy named Ike Bloom. Um, and he, for me, is the first Jewish gangster that's really interesting to discuss and describe. Uh, he's a kind of an over-the-top figure. Um, he, uh, uh, at times, as, as pressure mounted, and, that's, and really the Carter-Harrison compromise collapses eventually. And it's Big Bill Thompson who winds up coming in next, who is an overtly corrupt mayor. There's, just, that's, there's no question there. Um, and he, because... But the, the 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 people are pushing for reform, and finally you get you get the um, the anti-reform candidate, as it were. Um, but but please, you, you mentioned Ike Bloom as one of the early yeah. Jewish gangsters. Give us an an overview. Mm -hmm. Who, in your opinion, were some of the more colorful figures in Chicago's Jewish uh, gangster history? Yeah. Well, again, I'd I'd start with Bloom. And one of the things he was famous for was, in order to shock the pub the, the public, he would he would sort of famously parade prostitutes up and down the street. Um, it just you know, to sh to shock people. Um, that whole first ward area, and I think most of most people are probably old enough to remember the term first ward is just a, a synonym for corruption. Um, the first ward was full of people who were involved in organized crime and politics at, at the intersection. So um, uh, the most important family to emerge from that sort of area was, were the Guziks. So a lot of people probably know the name Jack Guzik, who, who is the most important Jewish gangster in Chicago history. I, I think I think that's that's pretty straightforward. Um, but his older brother, Harry Guzik, and in fact, before that, his father uh, was father was like a, a small time precinct captain. Harry Guzik was uh, a notorious uh, uh, um, pimp. He ran prostitution. Um, and uh, he's the one who's originally called Greasy Thumb. The nickname is given to him. Um, they don't know whether it's because of he's always greasy from counting money um, or because he was a waiter who stuck his thumb in the soup. You hear different kinds of stories. But, but Harry Guzik and his wife Alma were convicted on um, prostitution and sentenced you know, pretty substantially. Um, but uh, Governor Len Small, who was a corrupt figure at the time, um, uh, pardoned them. You know, it was it was very pretty clearly that the, the what was the emerging syndicate just got up got him a pardon. So that, that's Harry Guzik. The the sort of story about him that's striking is supposedly he had a uh, he had a young woman. It was a horror. It's a horrible story. They kidnap young women or they'd catch them off the train, and they would the term was break them in. They would literally be serially raped so that they'd be prepared to serve as prostitutes. And one of these young women managed to smuggle a note out, and she said, "Help! I'm being held as a white slave." Um, and so the term "white slavery," at least as I've heard it, actually dates to that sort of notorious moment in in, in Harry Guzik's uh, lifetime. What um, made uh, Jack uh, Guzik so significant as a crime figure? And yeah, one was what was his era? 
Um, so Jack Guzik emerges uh, as a young man already in the teens. He's even pre-prohibition because he's part of this family that's corrupt in this first world world. Um, he, he gets subsumed into um, what we now call the Chicago Syndicate has its roots also in the first ward where a guy named uh, Big Jim Colosimo married a woman who was already one of the big madams, became a pimp in his own right. And then he was the biggest figure in the first ward when prohibition came. And so members of his gang pushed him to do more and more. Eventually a man named Johnny Torrio, who was a lieutenant, sort of the rumor had him killed. So Torrio became the first gang boss in that respect. Um, and among the people he had working for him, Torrio that is, one was Al Capone and the other was Jack Guzik. And they're both young guys coming up and they became essentially best friends. So Guzik's career is launched because he's, he's uh, Al Capone's best friend. Hmm. Um, the last time Capone, sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. The, the last time Capone is in any serious legal jeopardy before um, uh, the income tax that actually gets him, he, he walked up, uh, Guzik was, had been in a bar and been insulted by uh, sort of an Irish tough. Um, and supposedly Guzik started crying as the legend. Guzik is always often emasculated. He's often um, sort of mocked for being a nebbish and a schlub kind of a thing, but he was the, the brains behind the whole syndicate for many years. Um, he walks into this bar where he's been insulted, comes out, Capone says, hey, what'd you say to my friend? And this, it's, this Irish gangster says, go back to your whores, you dago, to Capone, who then in defense of Guzik shoots him with witnesses. Um, so that's the last, um, uh, my, my understanding of this is that, and I'm extrapolating from a handful of different details, but that Capone and, and Guzik were so close that Capone actually came to speak Yiddish. Wow. Um, and the evidence I have for that is the actress Molly Pican, Pican who was the famous uh, Yiddish theater star, um, claimed that she'd done only two um, command performances in her entire life, and one was for Al Capone. Um, so you know, who, who were some of the other uh, significant figures, Ju you know, Jewish gangster figures? Um, well, it, the one, yeah. So so the ones that I trace and it's it's I, eventually I discovered um, there are really kind of three avenues. So there's the one that I spend the most time writing about. And I'll put that off for just a moment, but, which is essentially the West Side gangsters. Um, and then <clears throat> they're the gangsters in the first ward. So Guzik is the most important of those guys. Um, uh, because that's essentially, that becomes the syndicate. And there are important figures in the syndicate, including Lenny Patrick, who's on the cover of my book, who in many ways, he brings together all these different, the three different threads coalesce again in Lenny Patrick. Um, uh, for a long time, one of the guys who's, um, who's, who's, who's very prominent in Chicago is, is, a, is a bookie who supposedly, supposedly controlled the, um, the first ward. Um, um, Blanking on his name, I'm so sorry. Uh, everybody's pal, Jaime Levin, loudmouth, loudmouth Jaime Levin was the name, um, and Levin was the was the face of organized gambling in in the first ward of the Loop for for many years. Um, he was actually put on trial, and one of the motions I have I, I would be interested to see what some of you uh, thought of it. But one of the one of the defense motions was that he not be referred to in court as loudmouth Jaime Levin, or everybody's pal. Um, and he actually lost, as I understand it. And he, the, the argument was that he was so widely known by those appellations that it would be improper to deny them as, as part of as part of court. Um, he eventually wound up, I think, with um, he was either ALS or MS, some really debilitating disease. So in his later years, he was in a wheelchair walking around. Um, uh, um, there are a number of major gambling kinds of figures. A guy named Gus uh, Gus. Uh, Louis Alex Greenberg um, was very much involved from the very beginning as somebody who was he owned um, owned breweries, co-owned them with a lot of other figures, um, and he's kind of a mysterious story. A lot of it's financial crime, but I, the, the the detail that's always jumped out at me is that when he was killed um, at one of his funeral at his funeral, supposedly one of Al Capone's cousins said goes said now he's the richest son of a bitch in hell was the sort of dismissive line of him. So there's this whole weird cast of characters in the first ward. Then there's another group of people in the North Side gang that became uh, they became the gang wiped out in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And one of the, I've, I've thought about writing an article about it because I've never seen anybody really bring it together. But the names we know from that gang sound like they're Irish gangs, Irish names. So Dino Banyan is, is 
he's called the founder, but in effect, he really is only the co-founder um, with a guy named Nails Morton, who is Jewish and was a close colleague of some of my, my family members. Um, but also Frank Foster, um, Max Eisen, um, a number of very important Jewish figures in the North Side Gang. They're just not recognized as being Jewish. And in fact, although it seems like a very Irish gang, because um, famously Bugs Moran is the guy who's the leader of that gang when, when they're wiped out, Moran himself was actually not Irish, as a really talented researcher uncovered a few years ago. Um, instead, uh, Moran is French-Canadian. So uh, my reading of the North Side Gang is that it was it was the neighborhoods weren't as defined on the north side. It was a newer, it was the burgeoning part of the city in Prohibition. And as a consequence, there's a lot of name changing. So the number two guy in that gang is a guy named Heine Weiss. I don't know if that's a name familiar to people. Um, so you think, well, obviously that's a Jewish guy, but in fact, he's Polish. And he, that's a name that he adopted. Wojciechowski is his real name or something, some similar name. So the north side gang is loaded with Jews. And I have a sense that many of them were more consequential than a lot of the narratives have, have revealed. Um, by but, by saying West Side, are, is that synonymous with Lawndale? Yes. And, um, go ahead. Yeah, synonymous with Lawndale, but with, with very distinct roots in Maxwell Street, which is near West Side. And, and that, that's the community that was essentially sufficiently large to have its own economic structure within which it evolved Jewish gangsters who sort of controlled that neighborhood. So, and when you, and when you talk about North side early on, you're talking about what would be near North now in Chicago, as opposed to Rogers park, which came in. Um, yeah. More, more often uh, it is, it is going to be Lakeview um, Lincoln park. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so that far south, um, I, I, the maps have changed. But there was a famous saying about Dean O'Banion said, um, um, Dean O'Banion carries the 42nd and 43rd wards in his pocket, in his pistol pocket. Um, so I, I, I think the 42nd, the 44th ward, 46th ward was was um, Wrigleyville when I lived there. So I think it, that's probably all the 42nd may still be roughly Lincoln Park. Joe, the rise and fall of Jewish gangsters seems to be a, a, a thesis in your book, mm -hmm. seems to have coincided with the migration of Jews from one neighborhood to another. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, um, uh, yeah where, where, there are, where there are populations of ethnic enclaves, there are almost always going to be um, gangs that follow. So um, you've got organized crime. You can see the Irish gangs are, are pretty clearly mapped out in the city for the same way. So I don't want to distinguish the Jews, but um, Jewish gangsters You've got what I call that, what I was describing as the first ward, all the corruption that's there going back to the fire to 1876, essentially. Um, by the time Maxwell Street is sort of overflowing, there's a lot of organized crime that's taking place down there as well. Um, the Tribune used to send, because the Tribune was, was the, the blue blood newspaper, they would send reporters down to try to figure out what was happening. They, they do the occasional expose. Um, and there's a guy named Willie Block who had a place down there that was, in, this is still in Maxwell Street, that's pretty notorious both as a site of crime and as a source of place where Jewish tough guys would, who were together could then be called on to, to, to fight anti-Semitism. Block turns out to be a brother-in-law of my grandfather. He, he married one of his older sisters. Um, but there, there, So that's why I paid more attention to it. But there are a number of other... Um, uh, Jules Portuguese and his father have a have a have a bar in Maxwell Street. Um, again, originally bar usually also means gambling site, and then they just in prohibition they transition into blind pig kinds of things. Um, but as Maxwell as as Lawndale grew, that drew a lot of the the gangster activity there. Um, so there was a migration from the Maxwell Street area as an assemblage mm -hmm. of the Jewish community west to in, into Lawndale. Yes, a, a, a different gang grew up there. Yeah, one very much with roots. So again, my my own family is central to this kind of experience. So so Willie Block is a major figure in Maxwell Street. His brother in law Davy Miller opens up a place in um, in Lawndale, uh, right on right on Ed Kedzie and uh, Ed Kedzie, thirty six hundred West Kedzie, thirty two hundred Kedzie, Kedzie. Um, and that becomes a center of the Lawndale community. Uh, literally a community center. He, well, it was it was gambling, which was illegal, but it was food. It was um, they had a boxing gym in there. I was right next to the the um, 
uh, the 24th Ward offices. So it was all kind of taking place. A guy named Putty Annixter, uh, that may be a name some people know, it, it, it's spelled putty as literally loving putty, that other people were, they were putty in his hands, but it was always pronounced putty. So Putty Annixter had a place, his was the most, his was the first and the most prominent of those places. And, you know, if you trace property ownership, he also had some place in Maxwell Street, right? So a lot of the people who were second tierish Maxwell Street found new opportunities in, in Longdale and really burgeoned there. What was the uh, the heyday of the Lawndale district in terms of uh, Jewish gangsterism? Um, uh, well, for me, the heyday is, is early prohibition. You know, I think it must have been really exciting. Um, and I don't mean for, for crime purposes, just I think it must have been thrilling to be part of a neighborhood that was so young. I, as I picture it, it's not just young in the sense of new people have moved there recently, but in the sense that lots of children are growing up. Um, when I'm talking to, to audiences more familiar with New York than Chicago, I always say um, <clears throat> Maxwell Street is the analog of the Lower East Side. Lawndale is the analog of Brooklyn. And so it's the place of sort of one and a half generations in um, uh, and so my friend Irv Cutler, some of you may know, who's done wonderful tours for years exploring Jewish Lawndale um, and what was taking place there. It just burgeoned with community centers with, I mean, Yiddish was effectively a second language. And so in that space, you have Jews who feel um, unobserved and invisible by the larger city who begin with the gambling. Uh, at that point, they begin with the booze, right? It's easy. It's 19th. The, the Wandale gets settled around the dawn of prohibition that they sort of come, go hand in hand. So the Miller brothers are selling booze and gambling and they're involved in politics. Um, uh, so that would be the, early 20s. How long was the Lawndale um, area or neighborhood um, prominent in, in, in this way? Well, um, as I see it, in, in that era, the, it, my, my, I talk a lot about my own family because I obviously have, have researched it most effectively, uh, and in part because they were the losers, which means their, rec their material gets out there in the public. The, the far more successful figure in that time was Putty Annixter. Uh, so Putty's club is there from 1917, 18, right after the World War I, up until um, uh, the mid-30s at least, and the, the clear successors to that um, moved just a little west with Lenny Patrick, um, and that's, uh, they're at 3600 West, uh, Kedzie. Um, uh, uh, they're 3600, they're 3600 West, um, and uh, um, that, that, so it just really continues until the Lawndale Jewish population begins to diminish. Um, and what in is terms that? of um, uh, post-World War II. Okay. Post-World so, War II, yeah. So yeah. the, the, the West Side, as my parents used to discuss, really was a, a prominent Jewish area for something like 30 years, 30 years plus, from the late teens until after World War II. Absolutely. And I remember when I was living in Chicago in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, there were a lot of dem demographic specialists who would say, hey, you know, the, the, the uh, Lawndale still has a lot more Jews than you think, right? Many families moved, but it had a lot of, tended to have a lot of elderly who were there, from what I understand. Um, uh, so it was, I mean, it was a pretty still densely Jewish area, even though it ceased to appear that up until I believe the 70s, even 80s. Um, but yeah, in terms of cultural institutions, they began moving out um, pretty, pretty consistently in the mid 50s. A lot of your JCCs are closing, a lot of your synagogues are closing. You had a, a very interesting quote in your book along this line. You say that one strand of the history of Jewish Chicago gangsters was of Jewish politicians who had one foot in the world of crime and another in local and national uh, politics. Could you explain to our audience what you mean by that? Yes, I can, I can try. And it's always a little delicate because some of these people are ones we really, um, I think people we still tend to really admire. Um, uh, the, big, the big guy who falls into this is, um, uh, is Jack Arvey, um, who even I, I mean, I, did, I didn't actually grow up in Chicago. I grew up the son of, of Chicagoans on both sides of the family. All my extended family remained in Chicago. Um, but it was just a name that even I heard thrown around, um, Arvey. Uh, 
And I think Arby is in many ways a fascinating figure who, who, who's the one I have most in mind when I think of someone who's got one foot in each of those two worlds. Um, when he died, the Tribune wrote a really, in, um, I thought, I found really compelling editorial talking about all he'd done for the city, reminding readers that, that he'd been very much involved in negotiations with criminal figures. Um, as a, for instance, this guy, Zuki the Bookie Zuckerman, and I apologize if I'm jumping around too much as I go back and forth, but but Zuki the Bookie is essentially the right-hand man of, of uh, Putty Annixter. And he and Putty are the ones who essentially take knock my my family out of business is how I've been able to reconstruct it. So uh, Zuki the Bookie takes over my grand, my great uncle's old bar and he becomes the, the leading figure in Lawndale by the middle 30s. This is after prohibition and it's just, there's a consolidation, right? The, you know, there's just not as much money to go around and my family gets squeezed out uh, and Zuki the bookie takes over. Um, Zuki the bookie, sorry. You, you say that Arfi was involved in negotiations. Well, so- well, I'm, what, what sort of negotiations are you referring to? Well, as a, I, I, as a, for instance, Zuki was a precinct captain for Arby. Um, licensed precinct captain in, or whatever that means. He was listed as one. You can find it in like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing at the years because I, I haven't looked more recently, but something around 1928, you look and you see, oh, you know, his precinct captain, I forget which precinct in the 24th Ward, but that's RV Sky. Four to six years later, he's not there anymore. <laughs> he, he claims he's a precinct captain. He's not listed as such at that point. Um, uh, RV's successor is somebody who's a little shadier than that. Um, and that's um, Arthur Elrod. Arthur, he was originally born Arthur Axelrod, but he changed his name to Arthur X Elrod. And again, I'm sure that's a name that that that, that many people here are familiar with because um, his son, of course, uh, was was famously the sheriff for a time. Um, and um, Elrod, and I I, I, I hesitate, I, I, there may be relatives and I apologize if, if someone is here, but, but Elrod, I was able to find um, just in sort of footnote kinds of things, goes way back uh, to doing legal work for a guy named Jack Zuda who's one of the really awful pimps of, of the early 20s and 30s. He, he wanted, it, it's, it's a long and ugly story about Zuda, but, but that's, those are Elrod's roots. He kind of washes himself, that's in the 20th Ward. He goes a little further west, um, and in the 24th Ward, he reinvents himself as a sidekick to RV, and then RV somewhat famously joins the army in World War II, and still, still quite a young man. And in that moment, Elrod takes over, and there are pretty, I mean, I, I find them pretty credible sources um, uh, that, that describe Elrod as the one who gives the okay to the gangsters to kill Zuki the bookie. He says, look, I'm trying to keep the peace. Zuki won't listen to reason. What was happening in World War II was the, the gangsters were, the, 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 the syndicate said, you no longer get to keep 75% of the gambling take, you get to keep only 50%. Um, and so Elrod is, is, that's what I mean expressly by negotiations in that instance. Elrod's the one who says, I've done all I can. I throw up my hands. Do what you guys have to do. And, and Zuki is killed uh, very soon thereafter. So you, you hinted at the mutually beneficial relationship mm -hmm. between gangsters on one hand and politicians and maybe uh, members of the uh, Chicago Police Department um, uh, when you talked about uh, RV. Mm -hmm. But from reading your book, it, it was striking that there seemed to be an ongoing mutually beneficial relationship uh, between gangsters and politicians. How did they serve each other's interests? Um, uh, well, the, the originally going back to the dawn, and you can see it more clearly in New York than in Chicago, but originally what took place was um, the gangsters controlled the streets. Right. So they they would if, if you were a politician, you would turn to gangsters um, who could accomplish what you wanted to have accomplished. So I go back to ba John Coughlin, Bathhouse John Coughlin, Higgy Dean Kenna. This is in the 1880s, 1890s, although the two of them remaining in, in at least formal power for, for 30 or 40 years. And they would count on the gangsters of the first war to turn out the vote for them. Uh, there was one election for, for Big Bill Thompson. I, I think it's I think it's. Um, it's in the mid twenties when across the other, at that point, I think there were finally 50 wards. At one point there were 25 wards with two aldermen apiece, but um, across all the other wards in the city combined, um, Thompson lost by a fairly substantial margin. But his, 
his majority in the first ward was so significant that it overcame all the votes of the other, all the difference of the rest of the city and was sufficient to have him elected. Um, and there's even a possibility that, that there'd have been more votes if that's what he needed, that kind of thing. The first ward was gonna come through as much as it could. So for a long time, it's the politicians who control the gangsters. Um, in prohibition, there's suddenly so much money going to the gangsters that sometimes that kind of flips. Um, and the pro the gangsters begin to control the politicians. And certainly by the end of, well, Kenna and Coughlin are pawns clearly in the in the first ward. Um, they're, you know, by their their um they're quite old, um, they're feeble, but they're still being told to do what, what they do. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of the other famous uh, first ward politicians, uh, John DiArco and others who are kind of famously kind of in that same kind of category. Yeah. So the back and forth of it is that gangsters can typically get votes. Politicians can typically keep you from being prosecuted in certain ways. Um, and that's the back and forth of it. It's inconceivable in today's world that politicians who were up to their neck in crime relationships doing the bidding for gangsters would escape um, public trials and convictions. Mm -hmm. Even understanding that in Chicago, maybe the politicians were too connected to be concerned with, um, you know, bringing the trial, their, uh, their, their, their conspirators. Uh, but what about national organizations? What about the FBI? What about other law enforcement? Why do you think it was that they never um, tried to, uh, um, you know, put the finger on um, the corruption that was going on here? Well, th there is no FBI again until the 30s, right? Um, and even then, their, their primary, the FBI comes to prominence um, based on interstate crime rather than intrastate crime, right? So, it's, um, you know, you've got uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Melvin Purvis who are going after John Dillinger. That's the exciting stuff, right? And, and Dillinger, of course, is famously shot in Chicago, um, but he's shot in part because he's committed crimes that cross state jurisdictions. So that's one simple answer is as a federal government, we don't, we didn't have the tools for accomplishing that for a long time. Um, you might even think of some of the same issues uh, um, crimes around race that are taking place in the South. Those also require a kind of post-war consensus for a federal action to take place. Um, some of it is also, it's, there's a, it's really as a one hand washes the other. Um, the, however you feel about the machine, machine politics, um, I always, I, I, I try to, that sometimes I characterize it as a kind of socialism of, of, of the tough guys, right? It's, it's from each according to what we can get from you to each according to what you can take. Um, and, and there's a system in there that, that does sort of work. And to be fair, the open, complete crazed corruption comes to an end with Capone's, um, uh, Capone's arrest and conviction. From that point on, we don't have a guy like Big Bill Thompson who was just clearly uh, you know, in the gangster's pockets. What you get are, are politicians who are scrupulously crossing and back and forth to one degree or another. Um, and, and so it, it, is, um, it is a kind of reform that's taken place. You know, famously Chicago ain't ready for reform. You know, we don't want nobody, nobody sent all of those famous lines. Um, right. but, but those guys also know that there are lines they can't cross as politicians, right? They, they are not gonna be involved in certain things. Um, in other books about uh, Jewish gang gangsters like Rich Cohn's book, Tough Jews, Mm -hmm. There are stories of powerful gangsters like Meyer Lansky being enlisted by local politicians for Jewish causes, for instance, mm -hmm. breaking up rallies of the brown shooters. Are there examples of Jewish gangsters coming to the aid of ordinary Jews? Yeah, quite a few, quite a few. And um, when I first started, I didn't believe that they were as centered around my, my grandfather and his family as, as they seem to be. But, but there's quite a lot of evidence that that's what was taking place. Um, I mean, a lot of contemporary newspaper accounts. And, and one of my uh, friends did a series of oral histories of people who'd been involved with sort of being rescued by Davy Miller and others. Um, so I don't want to overplay him, but um, uh, but I, there's a there's a there's a prominent article that said, look, if 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 you were a Jew and you're getting beat up, you'd call Willie Block, you'd call Davy Miller, you'd call Putty Annixter, you'd call any of these places where Jewish tough guys congregated, and there was a likelihood that someone would come up in a big old car 
bunch of guys would pile out, tough Jewish guys, and they would fight. Um, Davy Miller gives an interview in Collier's Magazine in 1931 where he talks about how eight or ten years earlier, um, as he put it, the, the Polish community, um, they were fighting over um, Garfield Park, I think it's Garfield, um, and, um, and who would get to, who would get to basically, to, who would have a easy use of it, right? The Jews just wanted, they're just a bunch of people, middle, you know, middle-aged people, older people, kids just want to, you know, get the fresh air and, and, and they live in apartments that don't have air conditioning. It's, it's crazy. Go and, and, and so according to Davy, the Polish people were trying to put together a pogrom and they were going to march on down to, to, to the park and, and, and beat up any Jews they found. So he said, people came to me and asked me to organize a, a, a defense, and I did. And so we had, they called it the Battle of Garfield Park. It was, I, I, it, it, I think, the, I believe the forward wrote, the Sentinel, I believe, wrote about it. This was a more effective means of combating mm -hmm. sort of Jew hatred than Jews contacting the police to do something about it? We are talking about Chicago, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is the nature of it, right? And it's um, uh, so un unfortunate. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, that seems to have been the case at that at that point. I mean, you might have been able to count on police to help you at times, um, but but not always. Help from within was yeah. uh, more effective, and sounds like it was quicker. Yeah. Joe, much of your book focuses on Lenny Patrick, a name that might not be too familiar to our audience. He really wasn't to me. Uh, tell us about him. What stood out about him? Yeah, um, well, he's a sociopath, probably. <laughs> That's a part of it. Um, so Lenny, Lenny grows up and he's, it was kind of interesting as I was researching him, um, uh, I found that he was connected to some of what they call the 20th Ward group. So I mentioned the Jews moving west. They start in Maxwell Street, and then I, we sort of pay more attention to them when they get to Lawndale. But in between is the 20th Ward, which for a time was was controlled by Jewish politicians. Most important, a guy named Morris Eller, who's a name I find really fascinating. Um, another one of those politicians who was in and out of the gangster world himself. And to what extent he's a formal gangster, I, you know, you can make a case either way. Um, but he pulled together what I think may have been the largest group, organized group of Jewish gangsters um, in, in the city's history. The 20th Ward Group is how it's referred to in some of the literature and material. Um, and Lenny Patrick's uncle was a part of that already. So Patrick himself was a teenager watching some of these things unfold. Um, in late Prohibition, he hooked up with a, uh, a one-time public enemy um, who'd been, you know, by, by the end of Prohibition, you, you, the, the easy money's gone. So they go on a, a gambling, they go on a robbery spree in, I think it's in Indiana, Northwest Indiana. Never a smart move to cross state lines, of course. <laughs> and um, he gets arrested. It's it's silly. He gets arrested like getting lost in the woods. <laughs> he's he, The police have pulled over. He goes for a run. He, he's, a, he's, he's a city guy and suddenly he can't find his way out of a forest. And that's how they arrest him. He's sentenced to about 10 years in jail. And when he gets out, he's absolutely small time. He's running a craps game on the on the doorstep of my great uncle's bar. Um, uh, by that point, it's already I think by that point, it's book, Sugi the book he's already taken it over. But he's just on the doorstep running craps for the taxi drivers. Um, but he's there and he's a tough guy. And eventually, he hooks up with some. He, I think as a waiter, he hooks up with some of the guys who are really the Chicago syndicate. And the syndicate says, you know what? And I'm. I, anthropomorphizing a larger group into a single person. But Syndicate says, you know what? We can do a better deal. We, the, 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 those, those boys in Lawndale shouldn't be getting 50% of the take. They get 25% of the take, they're going to like it. And when Zuki and others push back, it's Patrick almost certainly, a guy oh, in partnership with a man named Davey Yaris, who are probably the ones responsible for the actual murders. But they're very clearly the ones who then pick up the pieces afterwards. And so they run gambling in Lawndale from the mid 40s into the mid to late 60s when because of the population shift um Yaris winds up in Miami but but um Zook, uh, but uh, Lenny Patrick winds up in Rogers Park primarily um and for what's left of recognizable Jewish community where crime is taking place Patrick is the one who continues to to undertake that even into the 80s um he's wow. doing a lot of shakedowns um I, I find it really I, I it's hard not to laugh but on two separate occasions, he shook he shook down. Um, one was his own son-in-law, and one was a nephew, I believe. 
just, you know, it just <laughs> threatens, to, threatens to, I don't know if he's threatened to hurt his own daughter or their son-in-law doesn't pay. I, I, the details are just absurd after a while. He was non-discriminatory. He was, yes. And there's a lot of gang that couldn't shoot straight. Um, uh, once, um, the, one of the stories is he was, he, he got a flat tire and I forget one of the local pizza uh, chains, uh, one of their drivers stopped and you know, just out of, out of human kindness, stopped and helped him change his tire. And as the guy pulled away, he's like, he got the idea to go and shake down that pizzeria because like, oh, he hadn't thought of it before. And all this came out at trial. So. Patrick was the head of Jewish gangsters in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or am I making too much of that? Um, I, 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 the simple answer is yes. Uh, the more complicated answer for me is that it's not like this is General Motors with a very clear organizational structure. I mean, Patrick clearly had a lot of influence um, and he, he was a very important figure, but there are a lot of people who kind of rise up and, um, and, and, and challenge. You know, it, if, it's not like people said, oh, you're the boss, I'm an account, how do you? It's that he was effectively the boss and he could scare people away. So, but there's this, every couple of years, you'll read about one or another Jewish um, bookmaker getting killed, stuffed into a trunk, because um, uh, they were people who were challenging him back and forth. What were the rackets that uh, Patrick was involved in? Um, for him, it's mostly extortion. It's kind of naked and ugly extortion. Um, uh, but that's by the end, it's mostly just extortion. Uh, in throughout the 60s, 70s, the FBI is very much interested in him. Um, uh, in once Bobby Kennedy came to have influence again in Washington, that's when the FBI really turned up its its work, and um, that's the first time you have federal investigation taking place in Chicago crime, and they identified 15 or 20 figures they understood to be major. Um, and one of them was Patrick, who probably was not as important as they thought he was. Um, but so they were they were following him and they, they got we have a lot of information, very explicit information about the kinds of gambling that he was doing in, in that era. Um, and they really had him dead to rights a couple of times. Uh, you know, they, they did send him to jail once. And eventually in the 80s, they, they said, we're going to send you to jail again unless you turn state's evidence, which he did. And so as part of his giving evidence, he essentially narrated his own autobiography on the stand, which I, I found that, that testimony is just fascinating. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you specifically about that. Patrick seemed to violate the first commandment of the mob credo, which is never ever to testify against uh, your fellow mobsters mm -hmm. for fear of a quick and painful execution. Yeah. And yet in the 80s, he, he testified against two prominent Chicago mobsters, Gus Alex and, and Sam uh, Carlissis, without suffering the consequences. How was he able to do that? Um, well, he did suffer some consequences. I mean, he actually, he, he was nevertheless sentenced to jail um, for a couple of years. And he was in the witness protection program for some time. Um, but the way I like to think about it, and it's a, a lot of mob people don't, don't necessarily agree, but that testimony effectively broke the mob. Um, so he's testified against Gus Alex, testified against Sam Carlisi. Um, uh, then I'm forgetting how it all came together, but there were four or five four or five trials that collectively just wiped out the leadership of the Chicago mob. And he was a primary, he gave primary testimony in at least two of those. And in a third, the testimony that did emerge came as a consequence of someone who'd been convicted on an earlier, um, earlier testimony he'd given. So by the time he's out and he's literally, I, I, I was trying to find where he was, but he literally just went back to, to Rogers Park and walked around. He didn't announce that he was there, but he was there. Um, and my sense is that they just the didn't have that much left. You know, if they had killed him, they knew someone was going to come after them, the killers. And, and what, what point is there if you kill him, the, the people who would have benefited from his death are already in jail. So, you know, he's just, he's history. When you said that Patrick uh, shook down um, people primarily, just private people uh, for a source of income, were these primarily Jews, primarily not Jews? Um, many were Jews um, and many were Italians, uh, but essentially the, the, the kinds of people he picked on were people who were already a little bit compromised in some fashion, right? They, they owed gambling money. Um, they might have been taking chances. They might have done some things illegal in terms of zoning, commercial kinds of things. So there are already people 
who are at some kind of risk, people who aren't able to go to the police, right? So I'm, I'm assuming that, that any, if, if Patrick had come to any one of us and threatened us, then we'd go to the police. So he was very careful to pick people who were, as I say, somehow already compromised, and he would threaten them. Was there a relationship between uh, Chicago's Jewish gangsters and Chicago's Italian gangsters, or were there turf wars on? Uh, uh, were there turf wars, or were there separate spheres of influence? Um, definitely a relationship. Uh, you know, it, it, again, I'm 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 sort of telescoping twelve or 11, 11 or twelve decades worth of, of history. Early on, they're in competition, direct competition. But very quickly, very, I mean, by the early to mid 20s, um, basically what Johnny Torrio accomplishes is, um, uh, I've heard it called the Pax Caponi, right? It's, it's the piece of Al Capone. And he basically says, look, they're, they're less concerned about taking from each other and more concerned about getting, keeping out wildcat, you know, wannabes who jump in. So it really is a, it's a collection, it's a confederation uh, that, that emerges. The confederation gradually grows so that this, the most important gang in that confederation is the, the Torrio Capone gang. They gradually acquire everything else and the, the, they go from confederation to corporation to syndicate is how, is how I read it. And um, by the end, everybody's answering to the syndicate. You know, New York, they, 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 they're much more at odds with each other. But in Chicago, it's, it's one giant sort of web of connections. Um, and many very important Jews, many, many Jews with very important roles in that, Guzik most prominently, um, but quite a few others as well. Um, and so they're working all the time with the Italians. Um, and in fact, the, the Italian mob as such is less Italian than you might think. Um, every boss we see is always, you know, Italian. Um, but the connection guys, Gus Alex, Murray Humphreys, Alex is Greek, Humphreys is, um, is Welsh, believe it or not. Um, uh, Guzik is Jewish. So many of the very prominent figures who are in that particular role are, are not Italian. And yet they're, they're crucial in terms of paying off politicians and negotiating a lot of the really dangerous work. Among other things I learned from your book was that the reputation of the Chicago outfit, at least for a time, was so notorious that there was suspicion of involvement in JFK's assassination. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, uh, I always hate, I hate to raise it too prominently because I think it, I think it's largely conspiracy thinking, although apparently there's a man who just came out in the last couple of days who was, who was one of Jackie's, uh, uh, bodyguards who said he, something about a second bullet. Um, but yeah, there was long time suspicion. Uh, many people suspect that, that JFK was killed because of Bobby Kennedy's push to undermine national organized crime. So there are quite a few people who trace that to um, to the Miami Cuban connection, right? Bay of Pigs kinds of fallout. Um, but a, a secondary, even tertiary theory that the Warren Commission did expressly investigate was that sort of through Jack Ruby, there was a connection of some kind. And Ruby, um, Ru sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Jack Ruby grew up going to Davy Miller's gym, so um, so you have that possibility. Um, I mean, they, they actually talk about the Davy Miller gang in the Warren Commission, like what was the Davy Miller gang? It's, it's a misunderstanding of a bunch of teenagers who went and learned how to box, um, is, is my, my reading of it, and would you know, beat up non-Jews and whatever uh, who, were, who were threatening Jews. Um, but but uh, Lenny Patrick was another friend of, um, of Jack Ruby. And so um, there, there's evidence that Ruby tried to get money from uh, from Patrick and from Patrick's brother. Um, so the people, the Warren Commission, were investigating that possibility that there was somehow a linkage. Uh, and I believe there's a Cuban documentary, or maybe it's a Russian. There's a, a, an international documentary that actually names Patrick as one of the shooters. But I, I, I don't I don't put any stock in it. But it's just it's these are stories that have been manufactured out of out of fear of the Chicago outfit. It's out there. I, I've uh, managed to hog almost uh, the entirety of our time together. Let me look at uh, some of the questions that have come in. And I'm happy to stay later. Uh, I, I'm really grateful to those people who are. Thank you. With all I want to do, I want to thank everybody who's listened. I hope I haven't rambled too much. Not, not at all. Larry Fleischer asks, have you interviewed any children of the individuals in your book? If so, what were the results? Um, uh, Oddly, you know, it's it's the I, I interviewed my cousin Davy Miller's 
daughter, um, uh, and then another of the Miller brothers' sons at one point. Um, and one of the things I learned is that they often don't know that much. Um, they've got an investment in how they want to see the the experience. My, in the case of my mo my mother, really didn't know her father. Uh, he was dead when she was two years old, um, so she really had no firsthand memories. And the family was was not un the rest of the family wasn't unpleasant, but she just didn't know them, didn't grow up with them. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Lenny Patrick's daughter, and it's interesting. I didn't have any connection to her until after the book came out, um, and I have corresponded, I think, a little bit with her boyfriend, certainly with people who are very close to her. Um, and um, I would love the opportunity to sit and talk with her at some point. Um, the book's written. I can't really change a lot of that. Um, I, I would be very interested in hearing what she has to say about it. I, uh, Mickey, before we were, were on air, I was talking about how I, I did get to spend some time with Sam Giancana's daughter, um, right. Antoinette Tony. She went by Tony, T-O-N-I. Um, and, and she had this really peculiar experience she would, she literally made a living. She wrote a book about her growing up as his daughter. Um, and she would go and give talks. And at the end of talks, she'd always say, stop talking about my father. And it was this peculiar quality. She, she, she was tired of the notoriety, but she was also um, basking in it at the same time. And, and, and um, I, I, she was, she was, she was actually quite friendly to me. She came and spoke to one of my classes and, um, even got mad at me once because I was slow writing a thank you letter when she came to speak to me. So I, I enjoyed my, I wouldn't, I would not exact, I would not elevate it to a friendship, but it was an acquaintanceship, um, an interesting experience. But I just, I feel sometimes as a, as a, it, from the methods that I use, it's almost easier to see the mountain when you stand farther from it. When you're right next to it, it's, it's really hard to make sense of a lot of, a lot of what you do know. It's hard to put it in context. Some attendees have written in sort of um, personal experiences or family experiences i'm reading uh, a, a lengthy such a um, message from a, a peter kamaiko who says mm -hmm. i know frank levin who's probably deceased had a restaurant on the west side during the capone era al capone's brother used to eat there ralph and no one of course ever bothered anyone at this restaurant <laughs> my dad and his uh, tough jewish friends such as a, a novice boxer, Harold Jacobs, have some stories that probably can't be told, uh, such as uh, that no Jews were were allowed at the South Haven Resort, which prompted a response from my dad and his tough Jewish friends. Luckily, my dad never hit me. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know Levin's restaurant. I don't think. I, 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 I might know it by a different name, but um, uh, my uh, my so I have to talk all about my mother's family. My father's family, actually the family that I really knew, I didn't know my mother's family at all. But my grandmother, my beloved grandmother, was a woman named Edith Stein. And some of you may be familiar with Joe Stein's restaurant, um, which was uh, um, across from the Edgewater Beach Hotel, um, like 5100 uh, uh, Sheridan Road. Oh, yeah. But before that, it was also on the west side. Um, and uh, so my family, again, this is this is the family that I really knew. And apparently Matt, not Ralph, but Matt Capone was a regular at the restaurant and he would, you know, they go in the back room and they talk. And my grandfather, Joe, um, uh, my step grandfather, Joe, Joe Stein would, um, uh, would be there and they'd start talking. Apparently he would say, oh, I got to leave. And, um, and, and the, the story was supposedly Matt Capone and the others would say, Joe, we trust you. Don't worry. And, and my grandfather, Joe's line was, if anything goes wrong, maybe you don't trust me so much. I'm not going to leave. So he, this was his, this was his thing. Um, so that that was a part of the tradition that we were, again we were talking about the openness of it. Everybody knew who these guys were. Now Ralph Capone was a very prominent figure. Um, Matt Capone less so, but still a, a figure of consequence. Um, so there's the back and forth of that. I see as well, Peter, that you asked about uh, Ruffy Silverstein. And I don't know anything about Ruffy's uh, um, criminal connections, but I do know that my uncle, um, some of you may know, uh, his name was Harold Miller, who was a, an attorney of um, uh, real estate. He was actually, he, he, he was instrumental in doing a lot of the condominium development law um, in, in nationally, but also, show, uh, also um, in Chicago in particular. Um, and my uncle just worshiped Ruffy. Uh, you know, even in, in his in his 70s and 80s, my uncle had, a, had pictures of Ruffy in his apartment. So he was he was a real hero to a generation of people who wanted tough guy heroes of the kind that you're describing, Peter. I want to get in a, at least a couple more questions from um, those those viewing this. Uh, Mel Motel asks, 
Um, really a very good question. Were any of these folks involved in Jewish religious community as well? Um, yeah, one of my, I, I hesitate to call it favorite, but it's just, it's so absurd. Um, uh, there was a guy named Maxie Eisen. There were actually two guys named Max Eisen. It's easy to com confuse them. One of them was, one was a prominent figure in the North Side gang, Jewish figure. The other was uh, more of an independent maverick uh, racketeer. And the racket that he developed and exploited was kosher chicken. <laughs> and, and so it's, 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 it's a bizarre chapter in Chicago Jewish history, but he, he, he first drove out all the, um, uh, all, all the, the, the rabbis who could oversee Kashrut, except for his own guys. So he had, he monopolized how you could get the Mishkiach, how you could get things, uh, characterized as 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 um kosher and then he raised the price from like seven cents a pound to nine cents a pound or something like that and pocketed the, the money um and it was so outrageous that apparently at some point there was actually a call for jews to become vegetarian for the short term to break his hold on the market um and and this again this is stuff that was actually written about pretty widely at the time um national you know national publications thought it was hysterical that there was this guy who'd done that um, were, was the fact that Jewish gangsters, by definition, were engaging in all sort of all sorts of illicit um, and sometimes heinous activity? Did that preclude them from some sort of claim that they were religious Jews as well? Um, uh, I, I think we have to speak to them as individuals. I, I, I suspect most would have understood themselves as culturally Jewish, it and they wouldn't, it wouldn't even have been a question. Of course, they're. Of course, they're Jewish, right? Um, there, there was a guy named Davy Miller, same name as my great uncle, who was prominent on the South Side um, in the uh, Reagan's Colts, who were a, um, a, a social club, an Irish gang. Uh, they're really the gang out of which uh, uh, the first mayor daily emerged as a young man. And they're also really most notoriously responsible in large measure for the race riots in 1919 that really, um, there were a number of really horrible um, uh, lynchings of, of African American Chicagoans, um, uh, and so one of the guys, this Davy Miller, was prominent down there. But his nickname was Davy Yiddles Miller, Miller. In other words, Davy Jew Boy Miller. And you know, it, there have been some historians who've conflated the two, which, to my frustration. Um, but Davy Yiddles Miller obviously is a Jewish guy who lives among non-Jews. I mean, that's that's you don't get the nickname Jew Boy if you're among a bunch among, among a bunch of different Jews. So. I mean, to answer your question, I, I suspect people who kill for a living are less likely to want to go to shul. Um, uh, um, I think it's just in some ways they're probably too busy. Um, there is another racket that takes place, particularly early in prohibition. Um, uh, it's 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 not that widely practiced, but it, it's it's a it's a small thing of some enduring consequence. Um, uh, prohibition permitted wine for sacramental purposes. And that meant that every synagogue had license to a certain quantity of alcohol uh, that they could get a hold of legally. Um, and it was based on the number of congregants they had. So perhaps unsurprisingly, some of very small shuls suddenly had an awful lot of congregants, at least on paper. And so there were rabbis who were sort of taken advantage of in that opportunity, who were maybe sometimes even taking advantage of themselves directly, who were purchasing wine allegedly for sacramental purposes that then got circulated into illegal supply. I think is our last question. Let me ask you uh, uh, another very good question. This one from Steve uh, Seelan. Have you done any research on either Red or Alan Dorfman? Um, Yes. Yeah. And it's it's hard, I think, to do a whole lot of Chicago Jewish gangster work without running into them. Um, Red Dorfman, as I read him, and there are many people, I, 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 my, my, my research isn't necessarily original. It's just I, I, I can put him into a, a different context, but there are some really terrific people who've written about that whole experience. Um, but Red Dorfman is uh, central in organizing um, the Teamsters in the Chicago area. Um, and as a consequence, as the Teamsters grow, because the Teamsters, Teamsters is, all unions are, are located, located in the locals, of course. Um, and it's the Chicago local that becomes very powerful under Red Dorfman. It's the Detroit local that becomes powerful under Jimmy Hoffa. And so you get this, this connection. The Teamsters are notoriously involved in, in corruption or organized crime. So if Jimmy Hoffa emerges as the national figure in the, in the Teamsters, 
Red is an important ally along the way. Red's son, Alan, and I, I believe he's actually an adopted son. I don't know that they're, I mean, not, not that it particularly matters, but Alan then is, is much, is the next generation, but he gets his um, financial services license and at an age that you would never imagine possible, winds up being hired as the administrator of the Teamsters Pension Fund. And that's a huge amount of money that he's then able to use. And it's, that's, it's, that, it's that credit, I mean, literal financial credit that the Chicago syndicate uses to purchase into the Las Vegas. Um, so if you're familiar with the movie Casino, where I mean, the yeah. Dorfman character is actually shot and killed in that movie. But if you're familiar with the movie, that's, that's how um, uh, uh, Las Vegas, which under Bugsy Siegel and Mario Lansky is famously a New York sort of formation, is that the Chicago mob gets into it through the lever of the, the Dorfmans and the Teamsters. So how did this all lead to Alan Dorfman's uh, uh, murder in, uh, in Lincolnwood? Um, well, the, the, the schemes fell apart. At Casino, the film Casino um, and the book on which it's based do a really powerful job of untangling that. Um, uh, uh, Lefty Rosenthal is a figure actually who, who sort of apprentices under Lenny Patrick and Davy, more Davy Yaris than Lenny Patrick, but he's part of that Chicago world. He goes to Miami and eventually he winds up in, in, in Las Vegas where he's a very prominent figure. He's the figure played by um, uh, uh, Robert De Niro in that film. Um, so it all grows out of this world. And when it falls apart, they're trying to cover up their tracks. And Dorfman is an absolutely central witness in all of it. He's the, he's the financial um, linchpin for the whole thing. So he's, um, it's pretty clear you, if, if you're trying to protect yourself, you'd want to have him killed. I think we've come to the end of the program, uh, Joe. I, I certainly want to uh, thank you for making yourself so available to us today. Uh, I, I, I think it was a you know, very fun and enlightening interview. And again, I thank you for it. Steve, did well, you want to say something in conclusion? Yes, I, th I thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, to mention again that uh, we, JLGS is a center for Jewish studies and Jewish law and Ju Judaic studies at the College of Law at DePaul. Um, we are, I, I know a couple of people have asked, we are, we did try to tape this or to record this, I guess you have to say in the 21st century, try to record this and uh, hopefully the rec recording will work. And uh, we can we'll, we plan on making it available at our website and so on. So we after the event, probably in a couple of days, we'll try to correspond with those of you who attended and let you know where you can find the tape. Um, we I apologize if there is some uh, problem for some people entering the program, but I think that always happens. I think that Murphy was a uh, very was was prescient and knew all about Zoom and other technology. And uh, I want to thank you again very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Krause. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Be well. It's, it's my pleasure. Yeah, if, if anybody, I would say, if there's anyone does have a question that I wasn't able to get to, I, I, don't, I think we probably have to go now, but I'm more than happy to, to email with people. Um, I'm actually behind a little bit in my correspondence, but, but I'm so grateful to all of you who, who were here. It, it's um, it, it, I'm really flattered. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.